Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Asian Impact webinar, which is entitled Two Years On COVID-19 Impacts on Gender Equality in Asia and the Pacific. Um, I'd like to thank Joe Veglich and the ERCD team for the invitation to organize a gender-themed webinar during Gender Month and for the ongoing collaboration with the ERCD on gender research and data. Um, my name is Keiko Novatska. I'm a Senior Gender and Development Specialist in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at ADB. Um, I'm the moderator for today's session. Um, I'm joined today by a very exciting panel of experts who will be discussing over the next hour new data from a UN Women's Survey that provides evidence on how women and girls have been adversely impacted by the, by the pandemic. So from the very beginning of the pandemic, researchers and gender advocates have warned of the long-term negative consequences if gender equality was not comprehensively integrated into pandemic responses. Indeed, um, Asia and the Pacific already had declining female labor force participation um, uh, pre-pandemic. And given the reported higher uh, female job losses due to the pandemic, we can only expect this to have worsened further. And that's only one example of some of the negative impacts. At ADB, um, we have been working hard with our government and private sector partners and other development partners to set gender targets in our COVID-19 lending and by prevent, providing technical assistance support. This targeted support um, has been key to ensuring that women and girls have equitable access to these vital resources in this time. Two years on, and as we hopefully look to recovery, it is now even more important to assess how women have been affected by the pandemic to identify inclusive labor market policies that will fast track women's labor force participation and how to integrate social norm approaches that recognizes um, the ways in which social expectations and roles of women impact on their ability to pursue different empowerment avenues. What will the future of work uh, look like for women in post pandemic Asia? To get, to get us started, I have the great pleasure to introduce the two presenters today from UN Women, who will present the preliminary data from a, rap a recent rapid gender assessment su survey, which was supported by ADB um, as well as DFA. The rapid gender assessment survey report will be launched in a few months, so we really do have um, the privilege today to be able to get a, a sneak peek. So, Sara Duarte Valera is the Regional Advisor on Gender Statistics in UN Women's Regional Office uh, for Asia and the Pacific, where she manages the flagship program initiative, Making Every Woman and Girl Count, as well as the regional program, Building Back Better on Gender Statistics. Um, besides planning and implementing interventions to support the quality, availability, and use of gender statistics across Asia and the Pacific, she provides technical advice and prepares analytical materials on gender statistics. Before joining the regional office, she worked as a statistics specialist at UN Women's Headquarters, um, as well as the, the statistics division of the UN Secretariat, UN ESCAP, and UNESCO's regional office for Asia and the Pacific. She's joined by Celia Tinonin, who is a statistics specialist also at the UN Women Regional Office in Bangkok. In this role, she provides technical assistance and capacity development to national statistical systems to produce, disseminate, and use gender data, particularly on women's economic empowerment, paid and unpaid work, and gender and the environment. She also serves as the UN Women Representative as the, um, at the expert group on innovative and effective ways to collect time use statistics and the ILO Working Group on the Review of Informality Statistics. So Sara, Cecilia, we're really looking forward to this presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Keiko. And thank you to the broader uh, ADB team for having us. Of course, we're, we're um, really excited. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen um, so you can all uh, see some interesting graphs. Um, so um, the, the report that we are showing you today, uh, the, it's just preliminary findings for the actual report that will be published um, very shortly. Um, so uh, please uh, consider this uh, quote unquote embargo, right? Like we, there's no way that you can access these findings online as of now, but they should be coming out uh, soon. Um, as Keiko mentioned, the report was produced jointly by UN Women and ADB uh, with the general support of both ADB and Australian DFAT. Um, and it's entitled uh, the same name as this seminar, two years on the lingering gender effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in Asia and the Pacific. It is a follow-up report to our uh, previous report on the effects of the pandemic on women and girls entitled Unlocking the Lockdown, which was now published about two years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. 
Um, so we decided um, that it was time to produce another report because two years into the pandemic, um, we know, of course, there's been massive effects on health, but we wanted to assess what are some of the lingering effects on, on other areas, such as employment, income, access to services, and paid workloads, the environment, um, and not just uh, look at some of the countries that clearly uh, suffer from a high uh, COVID case load, but also wanted to look at other countries that perhaps didn't have as many cases, but still suffer some of these lingering effects. Um, so we decided to run a second round of rapid gender assessment surveys, uh, interviewing people ages 18 and over in seven countries. Um, we use computer assistant telephone interviews, um, and we only consider cell phone numbers. We wanted to avoid using landlines because we wanted to avoid proxy respondents. We, we didn't want, for instance, a head of household to be responding on behalf of other household members. The unit of measurement for us was the individual, and this is essential to capture some of these gender inequalities. Um, we set quotas for sex, age, uh, region, and education. Uh, and when, um, after the survey was implemented, the quotas weren't uh, met, we implemented some booster calls to meet some of, this, uh, some of these quotas. Uh, prior to implementing the survey, we also ran cognitive tests, um, most importantly to assess recall bias. A lot of the questions in our survey as the respondent, uh, since the onset of COVID-19, have you noticed this or that? So that's a pretty long reference period. So we wanted to make sure that the questions were okay and were properly understood. Um, finally, the questionnaires were translated into local language, then back translated professionally into English to make sure there were no uh, room for interpretation. And the estimates were weighted using iterative proportional fitting. Um, these are the countries where we run the surveys. So two Asian countries, Indonesia and Pakistan, and four Pacific Island countries, Kiribati, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomon Islands, and Tonga. Um, and, and now let's start looking at some of the findings. Uh, first, the obvious one, health. Uh, we see that key challenges remain to access hygiene and medical supplies. Um, we see that in countries such as Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, for instance, more than half of the population is still facing these challenges. And as you can see, if you look at the, at, at the lighter bits of the bars, uh, the, the situation has improved slightly since the beginning of the pandemic, but in most countries, not that much. So clearly, uh, these are still um, an issue. When we look at vaccines, we also see some interesting findings. We see that complete vaccination rates remain low in some countries, such as you know Kiribati, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. Um, it is important to know that this data, the data collection was finalized in December uh, last year. So obviously, vaccination rates have changed since then. Uh, but still interesting to look at some of the gender gaps, because we see that especially in Pacific Island countries and territories considered, um, there are gender gaps and, and women are worse off. Uh, when we look at the reasons why people hadn't complete uh, the whole course of vaccination, we see that vaccine availability is still limiting access in, in most of the countries, right? So as you can see here, um, in, in between like 70% of population in places like Kiribati and Samoa to like I don't know, 40% roughly um, in Pakistan, um, people who haven't completed full vaccination course said the main reason is because vaccine wasn't available, right? Uh, this is very different in Papua New Guinea. As you can see there, that's not the main reason there. When we dig a little further, we see that the reason there is fear of side effects. That's the main reason that people cite. When we look at, uh, this is aggregated data for all of the countries, not just one country. Um, the main reasons why people didn't receive the, the full course of vaccination, so we're considering two vaccines as a full course. Um, we see the first one is availability, of course, but followed by being afraid of vaccine side effects and having been told that breakfast, oh, sorry, that breast, breastfeeding, breastfeeding or pregnant mothers um, should not get vaccinated. So obviously these two issues um, are very important for women and something to keep in mind for, for vaccination campaigns, et cetera. Mm. Um, besides looking at health, we also look at the environment. Um, we, um, we know that the COVID-19 crisis has overlapped with other um, uh, uh, environmental crises like you know, floods, droughts, cyclones, et cetera, in the country selected. Uh, so we looked uh, in the survey at issues such as access to clean water, uh, access to clean fuels, as well as use of public transportation, et cetera. Um, here in the slides, I'm only including this one slide on 
um, water. Uh, if you want to look at some of the other environmental effects, you'll have to wait until we release the reports. Um, so what we see is that some of these overlapping crises have compromised water sources. So in countries such as the Solomon Islands or, or Kiribati, as many as 20% of people said that their water source was compromised. Um, in, in other countries, for instance, Papua New Guinea, we see that urban areas are having it much worse than, than rural areas when it comes to water source compromise. Uh, but when we look at gender gaps, the only country where the gender gaps are significant is Indonesia. Um, and women are more likely to say uh, that their water source was compromised. Uh, the reasons for the water source being compromised range from you know, water cuts uh, taking place on certain days to specific reasons due to floods, droughts, and cyclones. Um, and not being able to afford the cost of water, which uh, we believe is very much a COVID-related reason in the sense that you know, all the economic strains brought about by the pandemic. Um, so when we look at the effects that this is having in women, on women, sorry, um, as you can see in figure 29, in places like Indonesia and Pakistan, uh, it is women that are disproportionately more likely to say that the time they spend on water collection has increased since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and this makes sense uh, because when, and this information is not shown here, but we have an additional question in the survey where we ask who in the household is in charge of performing this task most frequently. Um, and we see that in Asian countries, women are disproportionately in charge of, of water collection, while in some of the Pacific Island countries, it is men, and in others, it is more shared between men and women. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the findings that we see on the environment. And now I'll pass it on to my colleague Cecilia, who will tell you all the uh, juicy bits about some of the employment and, and you know, economic indicators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And apologies for the background noise. Uh, construction just started and we are on uh, teleworking modalities uh, until today's. Um, so we know that mobility restrictions and lockdown regulations put in place as safety protocols to avoid the contagion of COVID-19 has resulted in increased demands for unpaid domestic and care work. Unpaid domestic and care work is a form of work, more specifically unpaid work, and it refers to the unpaid provision of domestic and caregiving services to household members. So the final intended destination is not the market, but is rather the final consumption of these services by household member or family member uh, living in other household. This is also the activity scope for SDG 5.4.1, which monitors progress toward uh, gender equality. I'm sure that many of you uh, since the pandemic have experienced an increase in time spent, for instance, homeschooling for those of you that are children. And this is also being noted uh, more so by women than men in selected countries. Uh, so when we look, for instance, at um, time spent on cleaning or doing laundry, uh, more women than men in all countries, almost all countries selected, actually noted an increase in time spent on unpaid domestic work. The same applies to providing um, active care. Uh, therefore, we're looking at activities such as feeding, washing, physical care, unpaid medical care um, for children. This time has increased uh, and noted by more women than men since uh, the onset of, of the pandemic. Um, this is aggravating severe gender gaps in the location of uh, tasks within the household that were pre-existing, uh, so even before the pandemic. Next slide, please. We see indeed that when we ask in, um, our, our respondent who is in charge in the household of activities such as, for instance, cleaning, doing laundry, or feeding, physical care, medical care um, for children, uh, it's clear that in all countries, the great majority indicated that these are women uh, within the household. Why is this important? Because it is increasingly recognized that the unequal allocation of unpaid domestic and care work within the household, so unshared family responsibilities between men and women, act as a barrier to uh, women economic um, empowerment, more specifically to women participation to the labor force, decent work and, and gainful employment. Uh, when we look at the changes uh, of um, main economic activity, uh, we noted that uh, almost 40% uh, of people, uh, this is an aggregated figure, uh, noted that there has been a change in, in main economic activity. For the majority it was uh, temporary, uh, but for uh, about uh, 17, 18%, it was actually a permanent uh, change. 
as I said, this is an aggregate figure, but when we disaggregate by country, we see that it is led majorly by Indonesia, Pakistan, and Papua New Guinea, which were uh, among the countries selected, the countries that were most heavily affected by uh, COVID-19. So what are the shifts, what are the changes uh, among those people that indicated that they experienced a permanent change? Uh, well, um, sadly and worryingly so, the shift has been from employment, from paid work to unpaid work, and more specifically, taking on family responsibility as main economic activity without any income generating activity in addition to taking care of the family. And this shift has been uh, particularly significant for women, uh, more women uh, than men. I just want to give you and guide you through uh, very quickly through the graph. If we take, for instance, uh, Indonesia, we see that the light, um, sorry, the darker blue bar represents the level of employment, the percentage of employment of women currently, whereas the darker blue marker represents the pre-COVID um, uh, employment percentage of women. And we see a reduction. This is true slightly also for men, uh, but we see that uh, this has been affecting definitely more women than men. When we look at the lighter blue bar, um, these are um, this is the percentage of women indicating uh, taking care of the family as main economic activity without no additional work. This is important to remember because usually in surveys, uh, women uh, do tend to indicate taking care of the family and not considering um, their income generating activity as work. Um, so there is usually this bias that we took care of it during uh, during data collection. So this is purely um, women. Uh, in indicating having no uh, paid work uh, on the side. And when we compare with pre-COVID um, percentages that are um, signed here in the graph by the lighter blue mark, we see an increase. So there has been a drastic shift from employment to unpaid work, unpaid domestic and care work, um, significantly so for more women than men. This has obvious implication in terms of uh, women economic empowerment. When we look at, for instance, the percentage of individuals that indicated a change in personal income, we see that for almost 90%, in some countries, even 100%, it was um, uh, noted a reduction uh, in personal income. In some countries, more women than men, uh, but um, we can see that the gender gaps are, are small uh, because this is affecting uh, almost um, everybody. COVID-19 has also affected remittances flows, um, which we know these are important coping strategies uh, against income poverty and a source of livelihood for many women and, and men alike. Uh, and we noted that uh, for those that were receiving remittances prior to the pandemic and continue to do so, they, the great majority noted uh, a reduction in the amount of remittances uh, received since the onset of the pandemic. This has negative spillover effect on multiple, multiple domains, uh, for instance, uh, food hardship. Because of reduced household resources, reduced personal income, lack of resources, um, great number of people, especially in Solomon Island, but also Pakistan, Kiribati, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea, indicated that they face challenges related to food security. For instance, um, accessing healthy and nutritious food or going a day without uh, skipping a meal. Um, when uh, we look at um, what type of government support individuals have been receiving, um, uh, we note that social protection grants have been the most common form of support. Uh, by they didn't, in, on average, they didn't reach um, the great majority of people. In Pakistan, more specifically, we see that less women than men uh, receive uh, this type of support. Next slide, please. So we dig in uh, a bit more and trying to understand whether um, the most vulnerable segment of the population were actually the beneficiary of, of this type of support. And I'm going to end uh, my presentation with um, at least uh, one positive uh, note. And indeed, we see uh, that uh, individuals with the primary or less uh, than primary level of education were the one uh, receiving social protection grants in higher percentages in comparison to uh, more uh, educated um, individuals. Um, so, as, as Sarah has mentioned, this is just a very high overview. Um, obviously, the report will have a more in-depth analysis. Um, so, we're looking forward also uh, to discuss further with you later on, but also later on in a couple of months, 
uh, where we're going to release the report. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for um, that very comprehensive presentation of the results. Um, I've actually had a chance to read through their report, so I know how uh, uh, what a great summary that, that was and how much more uh, great results are actually in the report. So um, please look out for it when it does come out in a few months. So some of the striking results that I took from that presentation was how obviously the pandemic has disproportionately pushed women out of employment and into unpaid uh, care work how reduced remittances and limits to social protection coverage have increased women's vulnerability to poverty and how overlapping crises, um, and that's something that ADB also takes very seriously, so climate change, have further exacerbated all those challenges for women in particular in the Pacific. So I now have the pleasure to introduce the panel who will be discussing with Sarah and Cecilia the research and policy implications of these results. Uh, for those in the audience, um, I also invite you to start putting questions into the Q&A for both the presenters as well as the rest of the, the panelists. So Kelly Bird is the country director for the Philippines since 2018. Um, prior to this, he was the director for the public management financial sector and trade division in the Southeast Asia department of ADB. Um, before joining ADB in 2006, he worked as part of a USAID funded project with the Indonesian government um, and in 2006 as a consultant on trade policy with the World Bank in Jakarta. Uh, he has a PhD in economics from the Australian National University and has published several papers in international journals, including Applied Economic Letters, Bulletin of Indonesian Studies, Journal of Development Studies, Oxford Development Studies, Southeast Asian Affairs, World Economy and World Development. Second, we have uh, Dr. Marion Baird, who's a professor of gender and employment relations, head of the, of the discipline of work and organization studies and co-director of the Women and Work Research Group at the University of Sydney Business School. She is an internationally recognized scholar in the field of uh, women, work and economic empowerment over the life cycle. Uh, her research spans Australia and the Asia Pacific and has a policy focus. She has contributed to the development of government and company policies on maternity and parental leaves, flexibility, discrimination and the aging workforce. Last but not least is Sarah Elder, who's a senior econo economist and head of the Regional Economic and Social Analysis Unit in the ILO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Her areas of expertise include, among others, labor market analysis, employment policy development, skills and employability, promotion and youth employment. She has led a global program on the transition from school to work, um, assisted ILO member states on evidence-based policymaking in the Asia Pacific region and written extensively on issues of relevance to the world of work. So I'm now um, have the pleasure to moderate the, this panel and ask all panelists to, to reflect on a few of the results from the presentation. And I'll start, start first with Kelly. Um, as country director from the Philippines, you're especially well-placed to reflect on how the pandemic affected women in the Philippines. Uh, what are some of the areas raised in UN Women's Survey that had greatest resonance for you? And uh, please share any um, examples of approaches and programs that you think were effective in supporting women during the pandemic. Over to you, Kelly. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Kiko. And, and also thank you to uh, Cecilia and Sarah for, for their presentations. Um, uh, they were very um, interesting and, and uh, informative. And, and of course, also welcome to our other panelists. Um, um, I, you know, there were three things that resonated uh, from this presentation. And, and the first one, of course, was the uh, increase in unemployment, particularly for women. Uh, the second one was um, issues around, um, I know that spoke about water, but I, I think it's also related to food uh, insecurity. Um, in, in the Philippines case, um, what we've seen from the pandemic is that uh, the uh, woman had much larger increases in unemployment uh, compared to, uh, to men. Um, you know, traditionally, when you look at the share of unemployed figures, uh, women accounted for about 30%, uh, or just a little bit above 30%, but they're currently now well over 40%, close to 50% of the total unemployment. So, so there's been a big um, disproportionate impact on, on women, but it's also been um, on the uh, age as well. So we've seen a huge increase in unemployment of um, 
prime age adults between the ages of 25 and 50. And so you've found, you, so you've got this large cohort of women in that age group that have been severely impacted by, uh, by the pandemic. So they've, they've, they've moved into unemployment um, and, and other women who have uh, moved from modern employment into the informal sector. So we've seen this large increase in, uh, in actual fact, there's been around 3 million people have moved into the informal sector uh, as a result of the pandemic. A lot of them are women. Uh, they're competing in the same areas. So you can imagine uh, that uh, average incomes are falling as well um, in the informal sector. So it's, they've been hit in, in several ways. So that's, that's one that resonated. Uh, with me from the presentation. The other one is on, I'm um, kind of related to uh, the aspect of food. Um, they, they talked about water uh, and water insecurity, uh, but one of the areas that have, have been concerned for us, but also the Philippines government has been food insecurity. Um, and, and that's an area that uh, we're, we're looking at in more detail. Um, the, so, so what the pandemic has done is kind of exposed some of those gaps uh, in social protection around food insecurity. Um, and, and the food insecurity, particularly for vulnerable women in more remote areas. And then that leads on to other uh, social costs, particularly uh, there's a strong link between food insecurity, uh, domestic violence and child abuse. And so while there's been some preliminary uh, evidence or anecdotal evidence of this in the Philippines, you know, we do believe that it's, it's quite widespread. Um, uh, and and that's, that's an area I think, uh, probably not just to the, uh, uh, for the Philippines, but other um, countries as well, but it's an area that's been under-researched and under-focused, I think, um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, in terms of uh, just drawing on some of what ADB's been doing uh, in, re in response to the pandemic, you know, we've, we've worked closely with the Philippines in, in, in three main areas. One was uh, um, on grants, uh, grants assistance. So the, the Philippine government had a major um, program where they transferred uh, grants to uh, families, both poor families and, and middle income families um, to help uh, uh, get them through the lockdowns in particular. Um, ADB has been working with the Philippines for a long time on their conditional cash transfer program, which covers something like 3.4 million families. Uh, so we had on a program that was approved in 2020 for $500 million, which is to help finance the four Ps. But we also topped that up with a $200 million loan, which was emergency grants, which were dispersed to uh, four Ps. Four Ps is the conditional cash transfer program in the Philippines where families, um, uh, 3.4 million families uh, received uh, grants um, on the condition that their children meet certain um, conditions for schooling and for healthcare. Uh, under this particular program, it's, the, uh, uh, it's the, the mother that receives the grants. So I think the, the Philippines is quite uh, advanced in terms of its, its ta targeting of, of this particular program. Um, so that kind of covers something like uh, 15, you know, 15 million people. Um, the, uh, one of the, however, one of the weaknesses was that while the government has this very good program for covering 4P families, they didn't really have the database uh, and the information on these other families that were, were not part of that program. And so that was a big challenge in terms of targeting emergency grants uh, in 2020. Um, the other area that we're helping with is that we have a, uh, what we call the Job Start Philippines program, which is a uh, youth school to work program, uh, focusing on at-risk youth between the ages of 18 and 24. Um, uh, and and that um, so that's been going on for seven years. Uh, it, it's a employment facilitation program that helps with um, at risk youth going through life skills training, uh, technical training, and internships with employers. Um, that continued during the pandemic, although while there was restrictions on face to face training, it had to go digital. 
uh, but we continued that program continued and it's it's been implemented in 47 local governments and overall about 28,000 young people have gone through that program over the last uh, several years so programs like that uh, you know are, are critically important to help uh, young people transition from school to work um, and this is particularly important today because a lot of the a lot of the young people are obviously having difficulties integrating into the labor market um, in, in response to some of these issues, such as, you know, the need for reskilling and upskilling, um, we are now piloting with the Philippines government a, what we call a Skills Up Net a Philippines program, which is providing grants to networks of enterprises in selected sectors and locations that uh, will be, and those grants are to be used by enterprises in that network to retrain, upskill their workers. Um, but it also has a number of conditions, such as 10% of uh, trainees should be job seekers, so they should be those who've been displaced. But we also have minimums for gender. So, for example, we have we have five sectors. One sector is a thematic group, which is women entrepreneurs. Uh, the other four is uh, construction. So we have a minimum of, I think it's 30 or 35% of trainees should be women. In agriculture, IT, and tourism, it should be at least 50%, 55% Chinese should be, should be women. So we have uh, got certain um, targets to ensure uh, that uh, there is uh, equitable access for women into the program. Um, finally, we're also preparing a, a business and employment uh, recovery program with the Philippines that we do hope will be uh, approved towards the end of this year. It's a reform program, um, but in that we have a number of actions that are focusing on addressing that gap of uh, women who were displaced uh, in the labor market, particularly prime age women, but linking it with uh, vulnerability. So we are working with the Department of Labor to prepare a what we call a woman's job transition program. Uh, and and in, this, in this program, we're, it's focusing on uh, vulnerable women who've been displaced in the labor market. So it's going to include skills training, uh, uh, livelihood grants, but also um, childcare assistance. And, and this is a program that we're in the early uh, design stages. We're also working with the World Food Program in a voucher, food voucher program, uh, targeting vulnerable pregnant women. We're, we're about to start a feasibility study soon. And that's going to establish a food voucher program uh, for vulnerable women in more remote areas, but it's going to be integrated with um, uh, uh, skills training, uh, but also with um, parenting programs, because we have that link between food insecurity, uh, child abuse and neglect. And so this particular program will be focusing on addressing those food insecurity issues, uh, but also providing um, parenting interventions uh, to address the risks of uh, child abuse. And, and we're kind of, the theme under that, the principles under that is trying to create that uh, kind of stable, safe, nurturing relationships between parents and children uh, as a way to address um, the risk of child abuse. I'll leave it there, um, Keiko. Thanks so much, Kelly. That was um, really interesting to hear about everything that ADB um, in the what, what ADB has been doing in the Philippines over the past two years and also really exciting to hear about these new programs that really recognize those, those interlinkages between uh, gender-based violence, GBV, child protection, food insecurity and how they all come to impact and compound um, gender inequalities um, not only in the Philippines but as we've seen from the UN Women presentation in other countries across our region. Um, I'll now turn to um, Marion Baird from University of Sydney's Business School. Uh, any kind of two kind of two or three areas that kind of really resonated with you from that presentation? Hello everyone um, and um, it was great to be here it's just customary in Australia to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the land of the Camaragal people. And these are the traditional owners of the land where I live, which is just north of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, so look, so much to say, and I just want to pick up on a couple of issues, a general one, and then a couple of points that Kelly made, which I found really fascinating and excellent examples of what is happening in the region. 
Um, I've been studying Asia, the Asia Pacific for some time um, and women's workforce participation over their lives and really focusing on what are the stress points or the pressure points for them and those economies. And of course, the two big ones, um, have, well, the biggest one has been care and the other one is access to um, decent paid work or work that provides an income in good conditions. Um, and the care issue, I think, is a complex one because it's not just care of children. Increasingly in, in many of these countries, it's care of elders and of course, dis, those with disability and their communities. So the, the responsibility for women in terms of the care um, economy is huge, not just in the Asia Pacific, but it's particularly huge there. And for these women who are already in informal um, economies or informal work, they have been impacted um, so greatly by the COVID recession and more. And I mean, what we've seen happening and what you can hear from the presentations is we've got these overlapping crises. First of all, a health crisis, which directly impacted women because they work in the health sector and they provide health in their homes and communities. An economic crisis because they lost jobs. Um, then we have a climate crisis. And I think what Kelly is really pointing to, and we're seeing this in advanced economies as well in my own country, perhaps a social crisis emerging where those tensions in the home and the community of not having a job, not having access to food security or income security are putting terrible pressures on gender relations. And I think that's something we really have to start talking about um, in our region. I did want to, um, look, there's so much to say. I also want to just make one other point because I really want to get more discussion going. I was so interested, um, Kelly, in the point you made about these targets that are associated with the activities in the Philippines. And because one of the recommendations or one of the things I was thinking about is how do we ensure that women in terms of the future of work get into that IT sector? And we know it's a highly masculinized sector if left to operate on its own. So having targets if um, in there are terrific. So the, the question I then raise is, we get the women, young women in through training and education. How do we ensure that they can stay in those jobs and that what we have seen in other countries in that sector, gender-based harassment doesn't force them out? You know, that, that attitude that this is not a job for women. When clearly, if you think about where that work can be done, it is more spatially flexible than a lot of other work. It could be an opportunity for women to get into formal paid employment that has prospects for the future, positive prospects. I'll leave my comments there, Keiko. I'm interested to hear what others say. Thanks so much, Marion. Um, well, finally, I'll turn to, to Sarah. Kind of a couple of areas that resonated with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Keiko, for inviting the International Labour Organization. And I'd uh, really like to congratulate you and women for this report. I think it's it's very good news that we're, we're getting much better at measuring gender gaps um, in the household and in the labor market, showing where, where the, the pathways for men and women differ. Unfortunately, uh, this doesn't always lead us to, to finding better solutions, but uh, let's, let's stay with the positive and and congratulate us on uh, better measurements. So let me just pick up on what Mary, where Marion just left us. So Marion mentioned uh, the difficulty we have in getting women to enter some segments of the labor market that have been typically uh, male dominated. And this is often one of the big blockages that we have uh, because there's only so many female okayed occupations to go around, right? So clearly we need to, we need to uh, get women into all occupations. So let me mention where the jobs have been lost in the crisis. This was based on a discussion that Mary and, and I had yesterday. She asked the question of where, where the jobs lost were, what types of jobs were lost over the course of the crisis. And we, um, we're able to measure this. So I, I looked at our numbers for, for the Pacific, since most of these countries were in the Pacific Islands, and found that uh, the big job losers for women over the course of the crisis, and when I say over the course of the crisis, I mean 2020, when we had the big losses, 
then with some recovery over the course of 2021. So the big losers uh, of jobs for women in the Pacific Islands were the accommodation sector, no surprise there. Um, whoops, the others. Uh, and some surprises like, uh, well, air transport, uh, telecommunications, arts and entertainment, and oddly enough, the postal and courier services. Now, the good news here is that none of these sectors, with perhaps the accommodation sector, which uh, employed 7% of the female populations in the region prior to the crisis, none of these sectors are big employers of women in the region. So they're, they're more or less the, 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 the fringe sectors, I would say. Whereas the large employers of women in the region uh, were uh, public administration, education, retail sales, health and social services. These actually grew. Uh, we, we've seen some of them add jobs over the course of the crisis, but which is good news, of course. But back to the issue of that Marion mentioned, these are safe sectors for women. Public administration, education have always been dominated by, by, by women. How do we then get women into the other growth sectors, um, such as IT? And this is where we really need to, to work on the systems. Uh, we need to make it, we need to encourage women at, at a young age to, to, to take up these, these, these uh, jobs. And then we need to encourage them through the training system and make it a female friendly environment. So stay. And of course, a big part of this story has to do with the care facilities, which I'm sure we'll pick up in, further in the discussion. But um, let me finish with one, one additional point. While even if we might be seeing some recovery in terms of numbers of jobs, this is only one part of the story. And the part of the story that we're not picking up here is that um, we have seen a shuffling of, uh, of, of worsening. Um, we've seen within the sectors, women moving into lower paid and temporary jobs and um, increasingly taking up informal work. Whereas uh, these, these uh, they had better opportunities prior to the crisis. So th it is indeed this, this worsening in the conditions of work that's I think proving to be probably the most important uh, legacy of the crisis and the one that we need to, to work hardest to overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I think, um... You've raised a couple of really important points. Um, care has come up a couple of times already, and I think that's just um, from work, have, having worked on care for the past seven or eight years, I think it's very um, flagrant how much it's come up since 2020, and it almost seems like for once um, policymakers are beginning to hear gender advocates talking about how uh, unpaid care work does in, impact on women's work. Um, so I wanted to kind of maybe take it from there and um, perhaps hear from the panelists on any kind of good examples that you've seen in the region, maybe from the Philippines, on uh, how some of these governments in the region uh, can integrate those kind of considerations into their recovery response um, to build more inclusive workplaces. We've heard about female friendly workplaces. We've heard about the risks of sexual harassment. Um, deterring women and also just workplaces that uh, have uh, are dominated by these gender norms on what is suitable for women to be doing or, or not. And so how do we, like, are there good examples on how governments can build better decent work opportunities for women um, with that kind of question about the future of work for women in Asia? Anybody wanna jump in? Um, Keiko, can I just um, also respond to, you know, there was a, a question from Marion about, uh, and also Sarah about the IT um, industry, uh, particularly the, the share of women. So if I look at the, the Philippines, you know, the Philippines has a very large uh, business process and outsourcing industry. And it kind of covers different segments. It's the call centers, but it's also the back office, uh, accounting, uh, medical transcripts are becoming uh, increasing, uh, logistics, um, and within that IT industry, um, there's a kind of a fast growing uh, high value animation industry. Um, 
So if we look at it as the industry as a whole, about 50% are females. Um, and you've got about, uh, you know, 80% of them are college graduates. Um, and the ages range from, you know, 24 to early 30. So it's a very young industry. Um, what we're focusing on a, in our Skills Up Net Philippines program is we're focusing on that IT animation, which is still fairly dominated by males. Um, but it's a, um, it's a high, you know, it's a high value industry uh, and it's fast growing and it's very global. So we've, we've selected that as one of our sectors uh, and, and there we do have this target, minimum target of 50% uh, of the employees who get access to training should be female. So we're really uh, creating some very hard targets um, for that industry. Uh, and we're now doing uh, consultations with the industry uh, on the program. Uh, and we're asking them, the industry, to form networks of enterprises. So, you know, in the application form, and when they do compete for those grants, they have to uh, make, you know, the, there's certain conditions that they need to meet and to comply with. And that's, that's on the gender. Um, we also have conditions without targets on some other groups, such as disabilities, um, um, and, and we have a target on job seekers as well. It's got to be 10% should be uh, job seekers. So we, we are putting in some hard targets. Um, and, but in doing that, this is a, you know, a grants mechanism. So it, it is providing grants to the industry uh, for that skills training. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that uh, aspect. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Marion, I see your hand up. Thank you. And thanks for that uh, extra elaboration. Kelly, um, I just wanted to respond perhaps to two points you've raised and something that is coming through quite strongly in the questions from our attendees. It is this issue of gender-based violence, which we've touched on briefly. We often refer to that now as the shadow pandemic. This was happening prior to COVID, like a lot of our labour market patterns. It was exacerbated and has been exacerbated. Um, through COVID, I, I don't think we have a clear understanding really of, we have, we can speculate and many of us would have a gut sense of what is causing this, but I really think job insecurity and financial insecurity are huge drivers of these behaviours. And so if we can address those securities in a better way, hopefully, we can start to change um, the level or reduce the level of gender-based violence. I mean, it is probably the most pressing and most distressing issue we're now seeing. Um, you, and I don't have a solution for that, I'm really sorry to say. I did want to comment, though, on, you did ask Keiko is, if there is a good example of something that came out of the pandemic. Well, I think one of the good examples is it's making our, us focus our attention on labour market statistics and thank you to those people who have been collecting them and as Sarah has said we now have to be able to use them properly. Um, the other big area I, from my experience here in Australia I'm, and I recognise that this won't be the same everywhere is that the government was forced to pay attention to childcare and provide um, for a period of time and unfortunately it hasn't continued but for a period of time universal um, free access to childcare and that made a huge difference to especially younger working families where both of them are at work, um, especially in those jobs where they had to keep, it wasn't the white collar sector who suffered who could work at home, but those frontline workers in retail, in, in health, who had to, in public transport, who had to continue working. Um, so I think childcare is a, a good one that we could pay attention to more. And the other one was an interesting one that people haven't commented on that much, um, was the subsidy to workers who lost their jobs in the initial phases 2020 of um, COVID was paid um, if you kept your connection with the employer. So it was a close connection between work and the receipt of that welfare payment. And I think that's an important, uh, important thing to keep in mind. We do that with our parental leave system as well, because it sort of puts the onus on both the employer and the worker to stay connected which through a crisis period um, 
I think is very important because we know from all our other research around work health and safety, for example, that the longer people are detached from the labour market, the harder it is to rejoin. So if we can keep that connection through those policies in an active way, um, I would recommend we think about that in the sort of recovery phases as well. And when we come, inevitably, I would say, either climate induced or otherwise. Thank you. Thanks, Marion. Um, there have been a lot of questions actually, so thank you so much to the participants um, of this webinar. So there's a kind of group um, one area. There's um, been a lot of questions about gender-based violence or GBV. So um, these are mostly directed to Sara and Cecilia. So it's basically, um, were there any findings on linkages between the, some of the issues that you've mentioned in the presentation with um, GBV incidents? Um, Sara or Cecilia? Yeah, maybe I can quickly uh, talk about this. So we didn't include any specific uh, questions around violence against women on, on our survey. And this was on purpose because we knew we couldn't guarantee that the respondent of the survey, which happens over the phone, was going to be alone and not heard by their partner. Um, so obviously we didn't want to put anybody at risk. Uh, however, UNIMEN has been conducted a separate initiative, separate data collection and analysis initiative to assess the impact of the pandemic on violence against women. Um, so from conducting specialized violence surveys um, to actually analyzing uh, big data. Uh, and this is something that um, this is something that you will uh, be able to see very soon because we're about to release it. But maybe I can quickly share, if you give me just one second, one slide that shows this in some Pacific Island countries. This, as I said, we're about to publish this. Um, if you see this, these are online searches. So people Googling. Things like, so the first graph shows people Googling things like, um, what is violence against women? Uh, or, you know, bruises in my face, or how to cover violent marks, or, you know, things like that that relate to violence against women. The second graph shows um, people literally Googling, where do I find, uh, you know, help? I'm a victim of violence, or violence hotline number, or things like that. And when we look at those spikes and why the spikes happen, we see that they have to do with some of the overlapping crises, right? Like rainfall, cyclones, et cetera. Um, so, and also some of the COVID uh, spikes, right? With the state of emergency, when COVID lockdowns happen, et cetera. Um, so as you can see here, this is just to, to show you that, you know, there's clearly an overlap of crisis and these are driving uh, some uh, violence against women outcomes, right? So we don't know, um, we don't know, of course, uh, you know, that that exactly equates to spikes in violence against women, but we can guess that there, there's a correlation there somehow. Um, so yeah, just a, just a worrisome thing to, to keep in mind, obviously, uh, which is, you know, interesting to, to note, especially in the context of overlapping crisis. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, there's another question, I guess it's for you and women, but given um, all the panelists have mentioned data in some capacity, um, limitations on, on monitoring of programs, for example, so feel free to for any of the panelists to, to answer. And this is a question from Ram Ramulo, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So um, noting the existing data gaps on gender concerns and the possible inability of national statistical officers to respond, um, what, what can you cite any best practices for of national statistical officers from developing countries um, to uh, basically to collect more uh, gender statistics to to support their country's policies? Would anyone like to, to jump in? Good examples on how to support NSOs on collecting gender data? Maybe I can uh, quickly yeah. uh, say, say something. Yeah, I just, yeah, okay. Um, no, so I mean, on my side, I think uh, some some examples, for instance, the first round of rapid assessment surveys uh, that we conducted for a previous report, we did it in partnership with, with National Statistics Office, so obviously, um, and that resulted in, in places like the Maldives, for instance, using the data directly to influence uh, employment policies and extending employment, unemployment subsidies to uh, women working in the informal sector, right? So the National Statistics Office took the data and actually, uh, you know, made a, a real change on the ground, which is always what we kind of like strive for, right? Like what, what is data for if it's not gonna be used? Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, encouraging. 
uh, but in terms of like longer term measurement of some of these issues, there aren't that many countries that have been able to fully integrate, you know, uh, data collection and resilience, for instance, on a regular basis. And this is something that we're really trying to to support countries to do. Um, we have uh, designed a model questionnaire on gender and the environment, which includes some modules on resilience in particular, uh, to climate change, to, to disasters, et cetera, which very much relate to, to crisis you know, in general, right? So, so we really want to encourage countries to really start collecting some of these issues regularly um, around women's resilience in general. So from asset ownership to, uh, to anything, uh, regarding, you know, employment and types of employment, types of jobs, et cetera, um, to anything around how do you respond when a crisis uh, happens? Can you access uh, finance and a bank account? So all kinds of, all kinds of areas there. Um, so yeah, uh, no specific examples from any particular developing country that's already doing this, but we are already running this service in some countries. Mongolia just finished uh, this survey. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, there are lots of examples of developed countries, Australia, for instance, being one of them, right, that's been collecting uh, very meticulous data on many aspects of the pandemic, you know, from employment to unpicking on domestic work, etc. over, over uh, this period pretty regularly. Um, so hopefully we can expand similar practices in other countries. There's some really great, great questions in the Q&A, and I don't think we'll be able to address all of them, but I'll just maybe just one last question. So um, cash transfers are increasingly being considered to support women survivors of, um, sexual, uh, of GBV during the COVID-19 pandemic. Have the panelists come across any studies or reports to substantiate this trend? Okay, you know, if I can just um, uh, make a comment on that. Um, there, there are a lot of um, studies done in the US in particular on uh, the impact of uh, the COVID pandemic on domestic violence and child abuse, um, and, and also on social you know, assistance programs, income transfers, uh, housing programs, on reducing uh, gender-based violence. So there is evidence that shows uh, housing programs help to reduce, uh, so, so um, improving housing security helps to reduce uh, um, uh, gender-based violence and including child abuse. Um, and some of the income transfer programs also help assist by improving financial security. But particularly it helps to allow uh, women and children to, uh, to break that uh, cycle of violence, you know, um, by providing them with more financial uh, independence. So, so there, is, there is a lot of evidence that does support that, uh, but it's got to be coupled with other interventions as well. But um, I just also wanted to add what we're doing um, for the Philippines is that we're in the early stages of uh, designing a household survey where we are going to be focusing on uh, the um, domestic violence, uh, the incidence, prevalence of domestic violence against women, child abuse and neglect. Uh, we're gonna be looking at a, a, couple, you know, a couple locations in the Philippines. Um, and we want to look to see to what extent there is that statistical correlation with uh, food insecurity, financial insecurity, housing insecurity, et cetera. Um, the, the difficulties with these, I mean, for this particular survey, it has to be face-to-face because -face you can't do it online. You can't call them up. You do have to, uh, have face-to-face uh, -face meetings, particularly with uh, women and also children. Um, but there are ethics uh, that's involved uh, and you do need to have, you know, on our side, we need to um, have uh, the particular skills, which are the psychologists and so on, that we do need to have part of the team. So it's a little bit more complex to what we normally do at ADB uh, because we, it requires a specialized skill set. Um, the other difficulty, of course, is that you generally need to have longitudinal data, particular intergenerational data, uh, because um, there is an element of violence that moves from generation to generation, and we do need to account for that as well. So ideally, you wanna, you wanna have that, uh, those surveys that do cross generations. Uh, we won't be able to do that, uh, but it's something that, um, you know, uh, development agencies and, and governments need to look at more, more often is how do you develop that, uh, 
a longitudinal database on uh, violence in, in families. Thanks, Kelly. That looks like a really interesting survey. And um, there are a lot of great questions still in the Q&A, but we won't be able to um, address all of them. I also had a couple more questions on that final question about some of the reports. And I, I know that there's quite a lot of work being done um, by a World Bank social protection team. Um, they have a gender and social protection program, and they've been doing some RCTs in Pakistan to show some of those linkages. So encourage you to perhaps look there. Um, also encourage kind of um, those who do have some questions, maybe you can reach, reach out to us and we can um, pass on those questions to any of our panelists. Um, so a big thank you to Sarah and Cecilia from UN Women, to Kelly Bird, Marion Bird, and Sarah Elder for a fascinating discussion today that is too short, really, um, about the future of work for women, the care economy, and the need for more and better gender statistics um, in this region. So this is clearly part of an ongoing discussion that we are having within ADB as we gear our operations and lending to accelerate gender equality in Asia and the Pacific. So thanks again to Joe and Mel from the Asian Impact Webinar. Um, I also have the pleasure to invite you all to the next Asian Impact Webinar, which is taking place on the 6th of April. Um, and it will be presenting uh, the 2022 Asian Development Outlook, which will be launched that day. That also looks like um, a really fascinating webinar and I hope all of you can join. Thank you again to all panelists and participants and um, have a good uh, rest of the day, morning or afternoon. Bye.